Well, hello again. Welcome to Horror in Detail. Today we are going to share Wendigo encounter stories. First story. This story was shared by you slash sleepless from sundown. An encounter with a Wendigo. At one minute to midnight I took out the shot glass and put it beside the bottle of Jägermeister. I don't drink anymore after what happened to Pop. The one exception is the first day of September. The house is dark except for the warm glow of the three bulbs above the dining room table. I rub my tongue against the inside of my cheek. My mouth always goes dry. The only sound is the incessant ticking of the wall-mounted clock. At midnight the soft bell sounds, a miniature version of church bells. I fill the glass and hold it aloft for a second and swallow with a deep breath. The subtle burn winds its way into my throat and stomach. I wash the shot glass by the light of the moon shining through the kitchen window. Loretta wouldn't mind my drinking, but a used shot glass beside the sink raises questions. And I never like to talk about it. All these years later I still have nightmares. What I saw up on that mountain left a greater impression than any other event in my life. More than my children being born and my father drinking himself into an early grave. Loretta tells me I should talk about it. That it would help. She might be right. She always is. So here goes. I joined the park ranger service right out of school and it was a perfect fit. I took to academics like a fish to the desert and the outdoors always called. I passed my time in school daydreaming of the weekend and hiking or fly fishing with Pop. In the summer of 89, I was stationed in the Appalachians. Our jurisdiction encompassed trails leading all the way up the mountain. Up there the spruce thin out and clouds hang heavy even in fine weather at the base. I spent the summer clearing fallen branches from the walking trails after a couple of vicious storms over the winter. It was hack work reserved for the junior, but the truth of it was I didn't mind. The peak of the summer heat was spent and visitor numbers dropped as the weather began to turn. Persistent drizzle had kept me desk bound for the morning and we were about to get lunch when he burst through the door. He let out a moan and collapsed to the floor. Stanley leaned down and propped him in a seated position. Water dripped from his shoulder-length hair. His limbs hung limp by his side. I handed Stanley a cup of water. Stanley used his index finger to push down his chin. When the water hit his tongue the man tensed and his eyelids flicked open. He flailed his limbs and knocked the glass from Stanley's hand. The glass shattered on the floor but the man paid it no mind. It is out there, he said. What is? The man half turned and gripped Stanley's shirt and made balls with his fists. He repeated himself, pausing after each word. It. Is. Out. There. He started to sob. He released his grip on Stanley and buried his face in his hands. We lifted him onto a chair and he pressed his face against the table and bawled. I grabbed the rucksack he had dropped to the floor. On the bottom right was a name tag behind a plastic sleeve. Lenny Porter from San Diego. There was a number at the bottom. I'll make the call, Stanley said. When Stanley returned, Lenny was sat up staring blankly at the wall with red eyes. His face was gaunt like he hadn't eaten in a week. Stanley closed the door. I spoke to your father. Lenny didn't acknowledge the words. He sat motionless and unblinking. Stanley shuffled across to where I was sitting and pressed his palms on the table. Lenny left San Diego two weeks ago with a couple of friends. They planned to spend a month hiking the trail north. The father gave me two names. Freddy and Sabrina. When he heard their names Lenny leaned over and picked up his backpack. He rummaged frantically until he pulled out a stack of Polaroids. He flicked through the photographs and then slapped one on the table. 
Stanley and I leaned over. Flanking a fitter and healthier Lenny were what must have been Freddy, tall and wearing a baseball cap, and Sabrina, shorter and wearing a bright yellow top with an almost fluorescent blue belt pulling the fabric tight around her waist. Lenny fingered the photo and tears welled in his eyes. What happened to them? He sobbed and shook his head. He opened his mouth to speak but no words came out. Stanley took a map down from the wall and pushed it in front of Lenny. We are here. Where did you last see them? Lenny blinked away tears and concentrated. He squinted at the map and pressed his index finger down and tapped it. Stanley took a pencil from his breast pocket and marked the map with a cross. I'll notify the police. Get the truck ready to go. During training they told us about search and rescue operations. The rangers are the first responders. It was part of the job. Twisted ankles and wandering off the trail and getting lost are not uncommon and no reason to get the police involved. But this felt different. I secured the gear in the truck and Stanley appeared, flanked by a police officer in his early thirties. Harry is hitching a ride. His partner will take care of Lenny. We drove up the trail for about fifteen minutes with the truck until it grew too narrow and treacherous. We split up the gear between us and set out on foot. Our destination was high up the mountain and far away from the trails. It was almost as if the trails deliberately avoided the area. We hacked our way through the thick forest. How had they ended up all the way out here? Stanley checked his watch constantly as we climbed. He wanted to get there before dark. I figured we would be lucky if we did. Stanley and Harry talked like old friends, asking about each other's wives and children. The park rangers are in effect an extension of law enforcement. It made sense to be friendly with the police, and living in a small mountain town made it almost inevitable. I liked that. As the sun dipped below the horizon, Stanley checked the map. Almost there. Get your torches. All right. Harry reached into his backpack and pulled out a flashlight. I did the same. Do you know what's up this way? Stanley said. I shook my head. Somewhere up here is an old cabin. Hunters used it as a base back when you could still hunt up this way. The cross our friend Lenny put on the map is just about on top of it. Let's see if we can get there before there's no light left. We didn't make it by dark. Twilight gave to night with little warning. Soon we were relying on the light from our torches. Being on a trail in the sunshine lends a sense of security up here, even when you are alone. Now, surrounded by black and with the trail long behind us, an uneasiness grew in my stomach for the first time. Stanley paused and swept his torch. He muttered something under his breath. Harry took a few steps to the right, lowering his head and squinting. There it is, he said. At the farthest reaches of Harry's torchlight the cabin emerged from the woods. Stanley tapped Harry on the shoulder. My eyes aren't what they used to be. The cabin should have been a source of comfort, but it only added to my unease. The roof was half caved in and trees encroached on all sides, gnarled branches reaching out like fingers. The structure looked like it belonged more to the forest than to man. The only door hung askew on warped and rusted hinges. Two windows had long ago lost their glass. Stanley shouldered open the door with a grunt. Leaves and branches covered the floor, blown in through the open windows and roof. We dumped the gear inside. Stanley took out a lantern and tied it to a horizontal branch a few paces from the front door. He flicked it on and the light shone bright. If there was anyone lost nearby they could not fail to see it. We split up and entered the forest, guided by our torches. Stanley instructed us to go no further than the reach of the lantern. It was our lighthouse on the horizon. 
The wind blew in fresh from the north. I buttoned up my jacket against the cold. The beam from the torch was strong, but aside from the narrow cone of light, the forest was a deep and full dark. Stanley and Harry called out the names of the two missing, Freddy and Sabrina. I did the same. Every few steps I stopped and listened. The forest was alive with the scurrying of animals and insects going about their business. And the constant rustling of the wind through the leaves. It was hopeless. This was needle in the haystack stuff. Freddy or Sabrina could be unconscious on the ground a few feet to my left and I would never see them. We should camp and wait for first light. Harry's voice cut through the night, louder and with urgency. I skipped towards the sound as fast as I dared. The two torchlights of Harry and Stanley played close together, the beams of light trained on the forest floor. You might not want to see this, Stanley said as I came up behind them. It was too late. By the light of the torches I saw him. Flat on his back, arms and legs bent at unnatural angles. I almost gagged when I saw his face. The left side caved in, a red, bloody mess fragmented with the white of the skull. The right side was intact, one green eye staring up, wide and unblinking. The remainder of the face had an almost serene expression. It was not the look of fear that you would expect from someone about to have half their face crushed. No skin remained below the neck, the contents of his torso picked so clean I could see his full spine. What did that? I stammered. I didn't get an answer. Stanley fished the Polaroid from his pocket and studied it under the torchlight. He handed it to Harry. It's him. It's Freddy. Harry jumped and swung his torch out into the woods. I swear I heard someone talking out there, Harry said. We've been calling out their names too. No, it wasn't that. It sounded like whispering. It's the wind through the trees. Harry didn't look convinced. He called out the name of Sabrina and listened. Only the sounds of the forest. Stanley shushed him. There's nothing we can do for the boy now. Let's get back to the cabin and radio down the news. Stanley took a few quick steps towards the cabin and motioned for us to follow. He seemed agitated. I didn't blame him. I followed on his heels. Harry lingered, searching the woods with his torch until he too fell in behind. The inside of the cabin felt like a sanctuary. Out of the wind and removed from the mangled corpse of Freddy, my mind processed the sight. I had gutted my fair share of fish, but this was different. I put my hand to my stomach and swallowed hard. I was overcome with a compulsion to repeat my unanswered question. What could have done that? Before I could, Harry gave us some more bad news. There was no response on the radio, only static. It wasn't surprising, the cabin sat in a depression between the peak we crested on our way in and the taller peak beyond. We have to go back, I said. Harry shook his head. Not in the dark and not when there's someone still out there. We don't know if that girl is dead or alive, Stanley said. I heard her. You heard a whisper is what you said. And if she was there she would have come to the light. She'll come to the lantern and we'll wait for her. Harry threw out his arms in protest. Stanley sighed. If she's dead then we'll find her in the light of morning. If she's alive and nearby enough to whisper in our ears then she'll come to us. Two rectangles of light shone through the open windows from the lantern outside, but the front room of the cabin still had dark shadowy corners. Stanley took a second lantern and tied it to an old light fixture hanging from the ceiling. The room lit up as if under sunlight, but a cold light that gave the room a bare and unwelcome feel. I busied myself clearing a space on the floor beside the black pot belly stove at the rear of the room. Stanley and Harry stood as statues, staring up at the wall behind me. 
I turned. Etched in black soot onto the blank wall was some kind of monster. Long-limbed and with an elongated skull. It stared back at us through white blobs left clear of black. I took a step back and almost stumbled. What is that? I didn't need an answer. You don't live and work up in the mountains here without hearing the stories. Stories told dismissively by daylight, like you would talk about the monsters you imagined hiding in your closet as a kid. By night and around a campfire the stories take on a graver tone, and the name of the monster is only ever whispered. Wendigo. Of course I had never seen one. But if I had to imagine what one might look like, the painting in soot taking up the full height of the wall of the cabin was an exact match. I waited for one of the two men behind me to dismiss what we saw drawn on the wall. To make light of it and crack a joke. Neither did. Stanley uttered a simple instruction. No one goes outside without a weapon. Our shadows danced on the walls. The lantern hanging from the ceiling did not move. Stanley leaned and looked out the window. The lantern hanging from the tree branch swung back and forth like the pendulum of a grandfather clock. There was wind tonight, but not enough to do that. Stanley bent down and fished a rifle from the bag. My heart beat like a drum in my ears. And then something else. Whispers. What sounded like the whispers of a girl, entreating us, inviting us out into the darkness of the forest. Stanley inched open the door with the muzzle of his rifle. He stepped through the gap and watched the lantern on the tree come to a rest. He stood beside the lantern and searched the corners of the forest illuminated by the light. Nothing moved. Harry unclipped the leather strap on his belt and drew a pistol and went to the doorway. I felt naked and exposed with my hands empty. I took a step backwards, the wendigo drawn in soot looming large behind and burning a hole in the back of my head. A shadow flashed through the trees and Stanley swung the muzzle of the rifle and shot, the crack piercing the night. He raised the rifle to his shoulder and flicked it from side to side searching for movement. The lantern boobed up and down. With a rush a long-limbed creature dropped onto Stanley from above. He screamed and wrenched the rifle around but had it knocked from his grip. Harry fired two shots and the creature let out a wail. It bound towards the door and Harry slammed it shut. He pointed the pistol to the closed door and emptied the chamber. Harry took a step back and shot me a glance. Through the whole ordeal I had not moved. I had barely breathed. Was it dead? Was Stanley okay? The window, I screamed. The long thin fingers of the creature wrapped themselves around the inside of the window frame. Then the head appeared, uncannily human-like but distorted and disfigured. The chin elongated and the teeth like razors and drenched in blood. Its eyes white and piercing. Just like the etching on the wall. Harry grabbed me by the arm and hauled me into the back room of the cabin. He slammed shut the flimsy door. The back room was windowless and the only light was a thin strip at the base from the lantern in the front room. We crouched together, our shoulders pressed against the door. We listened. The light patter of footsteps. Two thin strips of black interrupted the strip of light at the base of the door. Something stood on the other side. Come out, it is okay. It sounded like Stanley. Had he killed it? Come out. Harry straightened and I grabbed his shoulder. Don't open the door, I whispered. They say a wendigo can imitate those it kills. My hand brushed against Harry's back and knocked the flashlight from his jacket pocket. I fumbled in the darkness until I found it and I flicked it on. I scanned the room for something, anything we could use as a weapon. I walked away from the door and kicked at the twigs and leaves on the floor. All that was good for was kindling. Something smelled rotten. 
There must be a dead rat somewhere. It's Stanley, Harry said. I pointed the torch to him. His eyes were wide and wild. He must have killed it. He smiled at me and took a step back. The door slammed open and carried with it the rotten stench. What stood in the doorway was not Stanley, but the Wendigo. Harry kneeled before it, breathing in the noxious fumes. I shone the torch onto the creature. Its grey skin pulled tight on a gaunt frame. And then something glinted. A belt buckle. Around the creature's waist was the bright blue belt Sabrina wore in the Polaroid. Sabrina? I said. It turned to me and paused, tilting its head to the side. I thought I saw a glimmer of recognition, a brief moment where it knew the name. But then it snarled, its mouth opening wide and dripping with saliva. It wrapped two hands around the neck of Harry and leaned in. I acted instinctively, without thinking. I jumped at the creature, swinging the only weapon I had, the torch. I brought it down on its head with all the strength and adrenaline I had. It bucked and sent me flying into the front room beyond. I threw out my hands against the fall and grabbed the lantern Stanley had hung from the ceiling. It could not bear my weight and the cord pulled out from the ceiling and I fell with a thud. I jumped up at a burst of warmth from my stomach. The lantern had smashed on impact and the white hot filament broke free of its casing. I groaned in pain and the creature lumbered forwards. I retreated into the corner of the room and pulled my knees up to my chest. It stood over me and opened its mouth, razor-sharp teeth gleaming white. Then the smell of smoke. The creature hopped and then scrambled backwards. The leaves and twigs covering the floor ignited under the heat from the lamp filament. A small flame burst up and the creature covered its face. Fire. It didn't like fire. I crawled forwards and swept as much of the kindling as I could grab onto the flames. The fire grew and the creature screamed. As smoke filled the room it coughed and spluttered. It made one last effort to come at me and then retreated out of the room and into the forest. I went to the back room and grabbed Harry. We stumbled out of the cabin, the fire now spreading up the walls and to the roof. Stanley lay below the lantern hung from the tree, unmoving and with a chunk of flesh missing from his throat. We ran into the forest in the opposite direction the creature had gone. We first climbed up to the crest and then back down the mountain. We stumbled our way down by the light of the torch. Adrenaline coursed through our veins and we imagined that thing right behind us, stalking us in the dark. When we finally crossed a trail we followed it back down to the ranger station. A team of police and National Guard hiked up to the cabin after the sun rose. The cabin had burned to the ground, the pot-belly stove the only item that survived the blaze. The bodies of Stanley and Freddy were brought down. They said Stanley's flesh had been picked clean down to the skeleton. That was the first day of September, 1989. Sabrina was listed as a missing person and her father spent a month in the mountains searching for her. But she's gone in every sense that matters. Turned to a wendigo by hunger for human flesh. She transformed into something unrecognizable from where it began. Around campfires people still tell stories of the wendigo. I don't know if they truly believe they are out there. But I know, I have seen it. Sometimes there really is a monster in the closet. Second story. This story was shared by you slash Tender Green. After the funeral. Our family was always big, we were farmers in the old country, and we were farmers here, up until a couple generations ago. You know how it is. Local farmers can't compete, they sell their land, move to the city. Go from working plants in the earth to metal manufacturing plants. Ha ha. Have less kids, because you don't need them. Anyhow, when you have a lot of family, especially when you have so many more old folks than young folks, 
you have a lot of funerals. I never met my grandfather. He was older when he got married, not to mention a smoker. My mother still talks about him often. She revered that man some kind of way. He was a Marine, fought in World War II. A Union man, General Motors assembly line for 40 years, and he worked with his UAW chapter long after he retired. He had the sight. The curse, as he called it. He'd had a bit of it all his life, but the war was when it came into its own. He could see things that other people couldn't, and obviously this troubled him greatly in the middle of a war zone. But his real talent, the real curse, was what he could see from the living. If he looked someone in the eye, he could tell things about them without even trying. Sometimes it was just innocent, he could tell you all about a childhood dog you had, what church you went to, where you worked and how you liked your boss, which part of fucking Sweden or whatever your great-grandparents emigrated from. But just as often he could tell if your brother had drowned when you were a kid and what his body looked like after, he could tell if you'd hit someone with your car on the back roads at night and never told anybody. You can imagine it was a burden. And now, he wasn't the first person in my family to be cursed. He'd heard things in turn from his own Aunt Dolores, from his grandfather. It's why everybody in the family knows you don't go straight back home after a funeral. That's a rule I don't suppose y'all keep, but I would suggest you do because of what my mother told me and what I am about to tell you. Even most of my relatives just took it as an excuse to go out drinking in someone's honor. They didn't know much better themselves. To be perfectly honest, I think that was all my grandfather had in mind after they buried Dolly. This was in 1960, when my mother was still a little girl. When she told me this story, she said she remembered the funeral, then going to the bar after with her dad. It was some dive he would frequent specifically because his co-workers didn't. With the curse, it would hurt him sometimes even to be around other people. He probably shouldn't have been taking his seven-year-old to the bar, the past really is another country, man, but if she behaved she would get a pop, which he normally didn't let her have, so she didn't mind hanging out at a table and drawing while he had his beers. Every now and then she'd get up and wander outside for a while, but all the regulars knew her so my grandfather felt safe letting her. My mother made her way outside while he made grunted small talk with the bartender. He hadn't even looked the man in the eyes, but he'd still gotten a wave of the curse, saw that he'd been cheating on his taxes for the bar. It distracted him somewhat. He was barely started in on his first beer when he got this prickling feeling on his arms and realized he hadn't seen her in a minute. His usual table was nearish to a window, so he got himself up and looked out to check on her. She was out there, standing by his truck. But she wasn't alone. He'd never seen the guy before, but he was hunkered low to the ground to talk to her. Normally, he wouldn't worry too much, but something about him was really off. He brought his beer with him outside. On the steps of the bar he shouted, Marnie. My mother turned back to him and, like a mischievous little sprite, ran to the truck bed to try and pull herself in. She wasn't quite tall enough, leaving her legs scrambling in the air. He swore and stormed across the parking lot to scoop her up, one-armed, and stick her back on the ground. What has gotten into you, you little animal? I want a ride in the back. He figured she was just being a brat, and jerked her along behind him. The guy followed him with his gaze as they passed, still crouching. Feeling it, he stopped long enough to size him up. That prickling on his arms had gone to his neck now, and down his spine. And just who the hell are you, he barked. The man stood up slowly, like his knees needed a long time to unfold. He was pale and sallow, and he smelled like heavy machinery. Couldn't have been over twenty-five but the bruises under his eyes made him look older. The big dark coat over his shoulders sagged, like he didn't have the mass to fill it. There was something wrong with his eyes, but my grandfather couldn't place what. 
They were big, wet, sunken, and bright blue. It's awful cold. Might I come inside? My grandfather puffed up. Mister, I don't really give a shit what you do, he said. But if I see you talking to my daughter again, I'll break your fucking arm. Come on, Marnie. He dragged her back towards the bar, and the man in the coat didn't follow them. When they were back inside, he glanced through the window, and he was still staring. One beer down. He made my mother sit quietly at the table the whole time. He looked out the window. The man was still there. Two beers down. He let my mother go to the toilet, but only because he stood guard outside and waited for her. Back at the table, he checked the window again. Was he getting closer? Three beers down. He was absolutely closer, and his eyes were so pale you could see them across the dark parking lot when the moonlight struck. My grandfather started to get itchy fingers. Four beers down. My grandfather looked out the window and there was nobody outside. Relief. He asked the bartender to watch my mother while he went for a piss, and then when he'd finished his business, took her hand and led her towards the truck, the door swung open with a rush of cold air. He hadn't expected the night to get so chilly. I'm sorry for your loss. He whipped his head around, stopping so fast my mother almost tumbled over. The man was right beside the door, out of sight from within, in a half crouch that brought him less than a foot from my grandfather. He moved my mother to stand behind him and retreated a few steps. Up close, the skin of his lips was blackened and bluish. What did you just say? The man searched for his words and then said, Dolly. He kept backing away with her, holding too tightly to her hand for her to squirm. If he hadn't been so worried for her sake, he might have been throwing punches. But it didn't seem like a good idea to touch this man, either. The lights from the bar were reflecting on his skin now, and it was waxy and thin. Have you ever seen corpse skin? My grandfather had, of course, seen plenty. What is it you want from me, boy? The man in the coat smiled with helpless eyes, like he didn't understand what my grandfather was saying. That was when he realized. It's awful cold. Might I come inside? For the first time since the end of his service, my grandfather looked into someone's eyes and saw nothing that he hauled my mother into the truck and took off. As he glanced up in the rear view, he saw the man in the coat slip in through the open door of the bar as another patron left. Then he was down the road, out of sight. Ain't he coming home with us? my mother asked. Already edgy, my grandfather asked what she meant by that. Kids say lots of weird shit, but what really spooked him, or so he told her later, when she was grown and could understand, was how disappointed she sounded. Instead of explaining, she just asked again, does he wanna stay at the bar? Is he gonna have a beer for great aunt Laura's too? They ain't gonna let him in looking like that. Is he? God damn it, Marnie. He thumped the steering wheel and made her jump. They didn't even have seat belts, so she was just squirming all over the bench seat in the back. Daddy, don't yell at me. Mom says don't yell, she yelled back, at the top of her seven-year-old lungs. Your mother ain't here, is she? Now keep your voice down back there, or I'll. And at this moment, he turned around in his seat to scold her, blurred out some threats he could probably make good on. Entirely without meaning to, he met her eyes. My mother had been playing on the steps of the bar, getting out her jitters from sitting still at a funeral. This part, she remembers. What she no longer remembers, what her father saw in her eyes, was how that stranger in the long, oversized, ratty trench coat poked his head up over the top of the truck bed and looked at her. How he had slunk out over the side and crouched down so he was of a height with her. And beckoned. She watched my grandfather's face turn white.
he turned back to face the road. It was years later when he saw him again. Family reunion, all the old folks with their albums and their family trees laid out on the table. He was a lot less skinny in the photograph, they took it before he shipped out. There was nothing to compare it to except the picture in my grandfather's mind, that cousin he'd never known. But he was certain. He knew what it was like to long towards home. Third story. This story was shared. By you slash Aslan sticks. Blasphemy brings Wendigos. I do not know where else to go. At this point I feel as if even speaking about this will make it worse. I should have never allowed myself to get involved in something I knew was wrong. We aren't supposed to speak of it. I am hoping that not speaking aloud of what I have witnessed will nullify the curse. I am assuming it's a curse. The Wendigo has appeared in my small rural community. We are so far from humanity that we could actually be considered our own little country. We have our own tiny clinic, we grow our own food, we have our own little church. We have our own little world. What I saw though, threatens to rip this little world asunder. Lord help us all. I know how it happened. I was there for the whole thing. This may be terribly disturbing to some people so, please, take care. Come on Zachariah. I don't think this is a good idea. You know it's blasphemy to talk against God. I tell him, a quiet plea dropped within. He smirks at me and shrugs, I just want to go hear what they have to say. I scoff at him, they are outsiders Zach. This isn't funny. Mother will be terribly mad. He shrugs at me again and walks towards the edge of the trees. He turns halfway to look over his shoulder at me. His dark hair sways in the wind, large black eyes twinkling with mischief. Are you going to come with me Cherries? He asks. A niggling feeling in my gut tells me that no good could come of going to hear a blasphemer. That in the very least, we would upset God and suffer personal repercussions. Still, if my brother is going to go. I should follow, if only so he has someone to share in his misery. That is what family does. I sigh deeply and nod. Following close behind him we traverse through the trees. Somewhere beyond the thick undergrowth and winding trails lie a clearing. It is here I am astonished to see much of our town. Led here by curiosity, fear, disdain. Here many of my friends stand, their parents, even a few town elders. No good can come from this. I muse to myself. A shiver chasing its way up my spine. The man before us and his three women begin to, for the lack of a better word, preach about their beliefs. I didn't really listen but, I could hear the murmurings of disbelief and some of revelation. Instead of listening to the babbling any longer I turn and walk back through the trees. Stepping into them I can feel a chill settling into my bones. A sick and very unfriendly feeling sitting deep in my stomach. I speed up. Something is very very wrong. The moment I burst from the tree lean, back into my town I freeze. I quickly step back into the tree cover. A creature towers over the mutilated body of one of the remaining townsfolk. Its skull-like face coated in thick blood, steaming almost from the warmth. Hollow eyes shine red in the dark, sharp teeth tearing into the human's flesh and bone. Sickening crunches and clicks as its jaw closes and opens. Its furred body is marred with slick crimson, long gangly limbs bent at odd angles. I try to keep my breathing shallow and quickly crouch down. I have to minimize myself to avoid suffering the same fate. The smell alone is enough for me to struggle against my gag reflex. Blood, decay, and death riding on the mostly still air. Lingering as if it was a living entity all on its own. The creature stands and makes a low, wah-wah-wah, sound. Almost too deep to be heard. It hurts my ears, 
causing them to throb with each wa. I watch as it slowly lumbers towards the trees on the opposite side of the clearing. Each step jolting and stilted. As if its limbs were improperly attached to its hips. As it vanishes I slowly stand and wait. Holding my breath in fear. It's quite some time before I hear noise behind me. Still I cannot move, cannot look away. Such carnage lay before me. Something evil was eating people and I saw it. The shock had settled into my system and I could not shake it off. A hand on my shoulder jolts me, awake. What are you? A familiar voice trails off. Screams fill the air and people rush out into our town, searching for the people they left behind. I move almost mechanically as I run to my house. The shock removing my typical feelings of panic and fear. I simply needed to know. Would they still be alive? Littering the front yard are the mangled corpses of my siblings. My mother. Something in me clicks and I scream. Pure anguish echoing through the wooded area. I scream and scream while my brother sits on the ground crying. Shaking, I leave my brother and begin to gently pick up the remains of my youngest sister. I carry her pieces into the house, bundling her in a towel and continue to do the same for my two other siblings. Then, my very own mother. I cry as I cover their bodies and fetch a shovel. At this point my brother has joined me. He gently totes their bodies to the far back corner of the yard where I am digging crude graves. It takes a little while. The shovel in my hands thudding against the mildly frozen ground. Each splinter and aching muscle a faint thing in the back of my head. Slowly, we place them in their spots. Covering them in the clay thick dirt. My heart pangs with each shovel full. Tears running unbidden down my face. The moment we are finished, I slump down to my knees, my hands clasped. I pray. I pray with all my heart. My words running together as I go. Stuttering and sputtering out our traditional prayers. I pray until the stars come out and my body shakes from lack of food and rest. My brother had long returned to the house. I jump when a warm hand lands on my back. Rubbing soothingly. Hey, you need to eat. You're freezing. Mom wouldn't be happy if you stayed like this. Zack gently tells me. I slowly and stiffly stand up. Every joint and muscle screaming with the sudden movement. My legs are quite asleep and I have to wait for a moment before I can walk properly. As I stand with my brother looking me over, I look into the trees just beyond the border of our yard. There, watching me, is the beast I had watched devour one of my neighbors. I glare at it. In that very moment, fear was the last thing in my heart and mind. No. For the first time, I was full of hate. Of the want to destroy something. A voracious monster lurked within my very bones as I made eye contact with that thing. That hideous creature. The moment my brother looks over, it simply vanishes from sight. Let's go. He takes my hand and leads me inside. You need to go wash up before you sit down to eat okay? I nod and silently walk to my room, grabbing a quick set of clothes and stepping into the bathroom. My mind simply carries me through the functions of showering and dressing. There is no conversation over our dinner. No loving stories before bed. There is no peace for our minds as we lay down to sleep paranoia eating at us. When will they come back? How do we protect ourselves? How do we save the town? Is God angry? Is this his wrath? The moment the sun rises, I am up and down the road. I need our weapons. Those fuckers are going to die. I also decide there has to be someone that knows how to kill these things. I ask around, Many people are beyond communicating. 
going through rites for their deceased loved ones and dying from grief. I ask after our elders and find them in the center house. How do I kill them? I ask abruptly, shoving open the doors. The two elderly men look at me with varying degrees of surprise and annoyance. You don't. One replies. A woman could not easily take the Wendigo on. Stupid backward thinking of the older generation. I didn't ask you for permission. I asked how. While all of you sit about and mourn the dead, someone needs to hunt those fuckers down. Before we all land up monster fodder. After a brief discussion I find myself with rope, knife, and gun in hand. Days pass. Weeks. No sign of them. Not beyond the low murmuring in the trees. Our food is running really really low. If we cannot manage to get food soon. We may starve with winter fast approaching. Walking out to feed our meager group of chickens I stare at the demolished hen house with mild horror and deep dread. Deep claw marks lay within the wood. Large cloven hoof prints mar the bloody ground. No. They are going to starve us. We can't wait around anymore. We can't. I pack some meager provisions and supplies. Char. You can't hunt them. They aren't deer. Think about this. Zack yells at me as I stand in the doorway, twilight behind me. We can't keep hiding and hoping they went away. We know they haven't. They are killing our crops, our livestock. Men have gone missing. Children. Women. He shudders and nods a bit, fine. I'm coming with you. We head out after he packs and start into the woods. A mile or so into the trees the telltale sound begins. Wah. 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 I tense and ready myself. Wait, it's coming from. I slowly turn to where my brother should have been. My eyes widening as I watch his skin rip and tear. Shredding and splattering hot, rancid blood, all over myself and the ground. Char, it croons at me. I step back, stumbling a bit on a branch. Char don't go. My brother's voice calls from the hollow skull. No. No. Zack. I scream at the creature. Wah. 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 It's laughing. Stupid child. All alone. All alone. Again. Something clicks and I raise my gun, hand unwavering as I empty the six shots into the empty husk. It squeals and jerks with each bullet. While it's off balance I fling the rope out and pull with all my force. Pulling it from its feet. It slams into the ground and swings its arm out. It slams into my shins and sweeps my feet from beneath me. I scream and try to jolt back to my feet. It thrashes against the handmade rope, the steel wire burning its flesh. I jump upon it and slam my blade into its chest, prying open the ribs with all my force. I quickly reach in, my hand clasping the frozen and collapsed heart. Yanking I fall back. It lets go with a dull, plunk. I hiss as it burns my hand but, run for my bag as the creature squeals and screams. I grab my homemade blowtorch and set to burning it to a crisp. The darker it gets the less the monster struggles. Soon. It is gone. My brother. Gone. I can hear the others as they come towards me. Now I type. I tell you what has happened as far as they fast approach my spot. Lord help our little town and please give me the strength to kill these fuckers. Set us free. If you have read this. I made it. I plan to tell the world of my victory, only if I survived. Don't go against your gut. You may just land up allowing a wendigo in. 
Fourth story. This story was shared. By you slash am Brango. My brother won't stop smiling. Something strange happened to my brother, Alex. He is normally a very stoic man, rarely showing any emotions aside from when he laughs. The most he can give me is a half-assed side smile or a faint chuckle. The only way to get any confirmation from him is by directly asking him how he is, which he is at least very honest about. He isn't depressed. As far as I know, we just suspected that he just isn't that good at expressing emotions. But one morning, things were different. Me and mother were downstairs in the kitchen eating breakfast. Normally, Alex is the first to wake up, but not today. We guessed he stayed up late reading or something. Eventually, he came downstairs, and my mother greeted him. However, she stopped her words halfway through. I turned around to see what caught my mother's tongue and saw something I never thought I'd see. Alex was standing there, smiling. No half-assed side grin this time, it was a full, ear-to-ear -ear smile with teeth. It was a normal smile, but seeing it on Alex's face, it felt much more significant than it probably was. It shocked me, and it shocked my mother just as much, like it was the first time we ever saw Alex smile. It took a few seconds of minor disbelief for my mother to finally ask him what he's smiling about. Eh, I'm just happy, he told us with the same smile on his face. Part of me wanted to be glad that Alex was showing a face other than the blank one he normally gives us. It was a good look on him, after all. But something about it was off-putting. Alex may have appeared happy, but he didn't make eye contact with any of us. He just stared right between us like each of his eyes were individually tracking us. His tone of voice wasn't any different from his normal tone. Upon closer inspection, it certainly didn't match his face, almost like he was pretending to be happy. Lastly, he insisted on skipping breakfast despite my mother preparing him waffles. He told her he wasn't hungry before grabbing his bag, his keys, and walking right out the door while wishing us well. He probably met a really cute girl yesterday, my mother suggested. I stayed home from school that day because I wasn't feeling well. During the day, a few of Alex's friends texted me in regards to his sudden mood change. I already knew what they were talking about, and I told each of them that he had just woke up in a good mood today. They all seemed pleased with seeing him happy while one of his closest friends joked about him, saying how his face looked like a puppet. I was resting on the couch watching cartoons when Alex arrived home from school. To my surprise, that same smile he woke up with was still there. I even saw the glint of his pearly teeth from where I was lying down. Mother greeted Alex as he walked in and, like this morning, was shocked to see he was still smiling. She finally decided to break the ice and ask him about what's got him in such a good mood. I'm just happy, that's all, he said with a steady tone. Mother pushed a little further and began asking questions. Did you meet a cute girl? Bump into an old friend? Passed an exam with flying colors? Anything at all? Nope, I'm just really happy. She excused him finally, and he made his way upstairs to get ready for work. Me and mom exchanged looks when he was no longer in sight. There was a cause for concern, but neither of us could put a finger on it. I spent the rest of my sick day upstairs in my room. I was able to hear my brother come back from work, followed by what I could only interpret as an argument between him and mom. It wasn't loud, but there was some obvious emotionally charged back and forth between them. Later, I heard Alex walk upstairs and enter his own room, followed by mom yelling, I don't want to see you for the rest of the night. When I came downstairs to see mother and ask what happened, she spoke as her head rested in her hand. He was sent home early from work, his manager told him that he was making customers uncomfortable with his creepy behavior and smiling. Days went by, and the same pattern repeated itself. 
He was still smiling every time I saw him, and when I wasn't looking, I could assume he smiled still. I would say that I was getting used to the smile, but, in all honesty, there was something that was making it hard to accept it. I couldn't even get an answer out of him since all he 